have traveled around the United States and the Americas, as well as in the continent, I am appalled at how much people don't even know who the African Union is. Even in Washington, D.C., people don't even know there was a mission that represented us. So needless to say, we, the African Union, we have failed but not do a good job of reaching out. So I have made it a point that every time I have an opportunity to address a group of people, I start by sharing a brief history of our African Union. The first ever known union of any African states was in 1958. This was when, as all of you know, Africa was colonized by many European countries, the largest ones being France and Britain. France gave its colonies two choices. You can be independent with no attachments to France, or you can be independent with some attachments to France. France did not expect any African countries to not want to be affiliated to it. But to their surprise, Guinea and Mali, they said, France, thank you very much, but it's time for you to pack your bags and go on home, back to France. In their anger, history tells us the French went into those two countries and took everything that they thought they had taken out. To hear Mugabe put it, they even took the last teaspoon and chair in those countries, claiming you Africans did not have chairs and teaspoons when, before they came. They proceeded to pour concrete into the sewage pipes, completely devastating the two economies. The then newly appointed president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, in his efforts to help these two countries, created the first ever known union of any African state. A few years later, a few countries met in uh, Morocco, and a few more met in Liberia. And by 1963, the Pan-African leaders of the time decided it was time for us to get together and undo the damage that was created by the Berlin Conference of 1885. The Berlin Conference of 1885, that is when our colonial masters, they got together after having traveled around the continent, found some of the most powerful kingdoms, kingdoms with such powerful, well-established civilizations and religious systems. And they felt that there was no way they would be able to conquer this continent unless they could design a way to make the Africans believe that everything that is African was bad and that everything that was European, particularly British and French, was better. So it was that by 1885, the colonial, colonial masters were ready for implementation of the rule of divide and conquer and the seed was sown. Berlin Conference 1885 gave rise to the small economies that you see today. Countries like Rwanda, Burundi, Togo, Benin. Economies that clearly cannot survive on their own. It was all by design to see to it that the continent was indeed a defeated continent and the Africans were a dominated people. So 1963, our Pan-African leaders came together and met in Addis Ababa and created what was then known OAU, Organization of African Unity. It was during that formative meeting that Kwame Nkrumah declared that you were not African because you were born in Africa, but rather you were African because Africa is born in you. He right. also declared He also declared during, during this formative meeting that Africa was for the Africans and that African Union was now. Those words were as relevant then as they are today. OAU was recreated and renamed AU in 2002, which is what we know it as. The African leaders meet twice a year to, discover, to discuss issues pivotal to the continent. One then begged to ask the question, why is it that 
54 years later, we are yet to attain the perfect African Union. The answer, of course, takes us back to the Berlin Conference of 1885. When you look at other ethnic groups in this country, they come together when it comes to issues pertaining to their countries of birth. You look at the Indian diaspora and the work they're doing in their country of India. I attended an event two weeks ago. This was a fundraising event by the Irish diaspora. And people in, those, the, in that room were congressmen, people from the State Department, for three, four, five generations removed, but they still claim their identity as Irishmen and Irish diaspora. The same is true of the Chinese, the Mexicans, all other ethnic groups. But when you ask for the voices of the children of Africa, the African diaspora, you might as well go to the graveyard because we're nowhere to be found. The rule of divide and conquer is alive and well among us. Last year, some of you may have heard, there was a story that came up at Cornell University. And this is when the African-American students were complaining and protesting against the continental Africans and the Caribbean students, accusing them of getting preferential treatments from the administration. So someone from the State Department had brought that to my attention and she wanted to know if I could give a press release. I said, well, what is a press release going to do? We must go and see the children. For we, their elders, have failed them. That we needed to have a conversation and begin the journey of healing and beginning to bring ourselves together as the children of Africa. As I was speaking to the children, I asked them if they had gone to the administration and asked if the enrollment quota for the black students could be increased. They looked like me, ah, oh, like I was talking about something they'd never even thought about. I said, let's take it to another level. If it was the issue was the foreign students coming from Africa and coming from the Caribbean, did you think about going after the Asian students as well? They again gave me this blank look. As the children, do you not realize that you're fighting for crumbs under the table when there's a full course meal going on on the table? But you see, the mind that is suffering from the legacy of colonialism and the legacy of slavery tells you, you must go after your sister, you must go after your brother. We have long forgotten that I'm supposed to be my sister's people. So to go back and say, why is it that 54 years later, Africa is yet to attain the perfect union? We've been told, your home, your continent, the richest continent on earth, the continent that has everything and anything the world can ever need, the mother of all mothers when it comes to continents. But you're told it is a continent of diseased and dying people. Constantly at war with itself. The wars, if I may say, are not of our own making. Not a single coup that has taken place in Africa was from Africa. A continent that does not have a single gun manufacturing plant seems to not have an endless supply of guns. You take an example of the Hutus and the Hutus during the genocide of Rwanda. There were more machetes brought into Rwanda that one month than any other time. And the story of Rwanda goes even deeper. It goes back to colonialism. Some of you may remember that Wanda was initially given to the Germans from the Berlin Conference of 1885. 
And then but Jim and then says, well, Belgium, you in the country? We'll give you one then. So the Belgians came in and they started looking at the Rwandese and saying, oh, you know, you do this. The angulation of your nasal bridge is closer to ours, though you, therefore you are prettier and more desirable. Try to dissociate yourself from these Hutus. So that bridge, that wedge of divide and conquer was being built. Then the Roman Catholic priest came along and said, oh, you Hutus, do you not see what is being done to you by the Tutsis? You must prepare to fight back because the Tutsis want to destroy you. So what we, what we saw during genocide was something that had been in the making for a very long time. I can tell you story upon story upon story. The most known one is the, the coup that was supposed to take place in Equatorial Guinea about 23 years ago. It was a bunch of rich young men from Britain, Australia, and New Zealand having fun in South Africa. And when they found out Equatorial Guinea had discovered oil, they wanted to go and take it all. So a plan was hitched where they were going to go in and start a civil war, a coup in Equatorial Guinea. So while the people of Guinea are fighting a civil war, they are busy siphoning the oil. But they made one mistake. As they were collecting their guns, they wanted to stop and pick up some more guns in Zimbabwe. Mugabe smelt a rat and wondered why young people who were going to hunt in Equatorial Guinea needed such powerful guns. So investigating further, he uncovered the plot. So he allowed the young men to come to Zimbabwe, loaded up their plane, but just before takeoff, all of them were arrested. And one of them was actually the ringleader, the former Prime Minister of Britain, Margaret uh, Thatcher. That was his son, who was leading. So while the people of Guinea would have been killing each other during a civil war that had nothing to do with them, the world would sit back and say, oh, look at those Africans again. There they go. I'm saying this to say, you need to know your history. And you need to know 